Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode of the Hero Academy podcast. I am very excited because I have my buddy Gavin Stone, uh, international spy and author. My second spy is spy a good word? Is that is that like is, does it have a negative connotation? Uh, it can do. But it's believe it or not, it's not the actual correct word for what we do. But it's intelligence. It's the one right? Everybody recognizes. Yeah, it, yeah. It's it's intelligence. Yeah, so usually it's an intelligence officer or or whatever the case may be, you know, depending on what agency you're working for. Uh, the spy is usually the person that the intelligence officer recruits. So, but we can get it a little bit deeper into that if you want to. But okay, it's, yeah, you know, no, I understand that. I understand that principle from law enforcement when they use mm -hmm. an when they use an a buy a buying agent. Yeah, like I, was, yeah. I was telling you I wanted to go to narco, but that didn't happen for me. <laughs> uh, life had another route for me, which is all good. Um, uh, maybe that wasn't supposed to be my path. Um, but this isn't about me. Let's talk about your <laughs> career. Uh, I asked you where you're in the military, and you said no, I wasn't in the military either. Mm, but right. you were in a secret intelligence agency. Well, yeah, uh, which is, which is more fun because we get to play with all the military's toys without doing any of the press ups and the running, so they kind of hate us a little bit. Um, yeah, we get to do some of the training, um, and and basically all the fun stuff without any of the uh, without any of the hard work. So yeah, they <laughs> they generally don't like the spooks, as it were. Are you allowed to say what agency you work for? Normally, I don't um, ask people. And uh, you don't you don't have to say because normally I don't even ask people what agency they work for. I've actually been one of the very few lucky guys because I spent most of my career as a contractor. So I've worked at the majority of it freelance, and I've been oh, cool. very I've had a very lucky kind of um, uh, life of, of of being able to work for various different agencies and customers and and brokers and that kind of thing. So I won't say which ones I have. Uh, work for, but I will let you know that I've worked for both British and American governments as well as private. Uh, that's pretty cool. Are you, uh, are you in Europe right now? Or are you in America? I'm, I'm in Europe at the moment. I'm in, I'm in England at the minute on the southwest coast, but uh, have lived over in the states and and intend on going back there at some point. That's awesome. I've never been to London, and if you ever have an event where they'll pay me to come and speak, <laughs> I would love to go. But I've decided for 2024 that I'm only going places where they pay me to come <laughs> and then, and then I can turn it into a write off and, and a, you've done a little bit of speaking, right? I have. Yeah. I've done a little can you, bit. Can you just tell the audience about your career just so we can get caught up real quick? Yeah, so like the, the the bullet points of my career, I started off at the very bottom of the pile doing like private investigations and process serving, which is just like kind of bread and butter stuff. And it kind of I got I got spotted as being somebody who's good at being able to find people. And then it kind of built up from there and it went on to missing persons. It went on to fraud investigations and I started rubbing shoulders with the right people. I got into intelligence gathering. This is like a kind of over a 20 year span. I'm going to summarize it. That's cool. Um, that's cool. And, and just by getting with the right people at the right time and, and making the right friends, I managed to, to start working, you know, for, for, uh, you know, down the road of human intelligence gathering for the, for the governments and that kind of thing. I've done a little bit of everything from close protection to penetration testing and, and everything in between. Um, and then eventually, you know, I got um, I, I made friends with somebody at the British Ministry of Defence, which is like your DIA, um, yeah. and just CIA, uh, got, CIA. Uh, yeah, no, no, your your DIA or your DOD. Um, oh, okay. There. So and um, and and just did a, a little bit for I'd contracted previously for the MOD, but never been on the books. And then I, I took a nice little sweet job for a while. Um, I didn't do it for very long because I then went on that somebody said, look, you know, you, you're good at this. Can we get you to train our guys to bring them up to the level you're at kind of thing? Yeah. Um, so I, I went down that route of teaching and training as well. So that, that's kind of um, 20 odd years in, in 60 seconds. <laughs> yeah, that was really good. That was really good. So um, I like to bring people up to speed with the acronyms because every department, every country, Every agency has its own acronyms. So you mentioned uh, the MIA, uh, the DOD. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody knows what the CIA stands for, Central yeah. Intelligence Agency. Uh, what's the DIA? The DIA is your guys' Defense Intelligence Agency, which is and they're very... separate. They're separate from the CIA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, see, so there's all, so many. So you, you, you guys, I believe at the minute, I think you're up to seventeen different intelligence agencies. Um, like oh I mean, God. you know, you've got like the NGA who have um 
had a few friends in the NGO, the, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, um, uh, and uh, you know your CIA is obviously the, the most famous one. Um, yeah, and I, I, you know, got, and I got friends from all over, from MI6, KGB. Um, the, the KGB is the one that gets people. Because I say, well, what does that stand for? And when you tell them it stands for the Committee of State Security, they go, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard of the KGB. I'm old enough to know uh, the KGB from yeah. movies and everything. So is human intelligence anything like Jason Bourne? <laughs> <laughs> um not if you're doing it properly <laughs> not if you're doing it properly yeah um if if you're going into a country and there's explosions and gunfights and high speed chases and everything else then basically you've done it wrong extremely wrong the idea is you get in you get what you need and you get out and nobody even ever remembers that you were there you know apart from the guy who who you've kind of recruited that's the general gist of it so i mean you know obviously there are always precautionary measures taken so that if things do go wrong and you have to do an evac or you have to you know you you do you do have training for this kind of thing if you're captured or, or whatever but uh but yeah it's uh if you've done it all properly there's no bang <laughs> do you feel like you have the kind of face that people feel like they've met you before because a lot of people I have a very friendly face and a lot of people feel like they've seen me or met me before. And I feel like, um, like in the gym today, a guy remembered me from like 15 years ago, oh, uh, right. arresting him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I was like, well, was I a jerk to you or was I cool? And he's like, no, you were cool. You <laughs> I was like, all right, good, good. That's all that matters. But like, do people, my question is, are you, are you memorable? Or are you more like, you slip in and people don't remember that you were there. Now that would depend entirely on the role I'm trying to play. If I want to kind of get into somewhere and get some information and then leave, I will do absolutely everything in, in what they call gray man mode. So I will have no VDMs on any of my, my clothes. I'll all be playing. I will have a haircut that is kind of short enough not to be short shaven, but not long enough to be long. It'll be as undescript as possible, you know, even down to the way I shave you know, there'll be like kind of growth there enough so you're not clean shaven, but not long enough to call stubble, not long enough to be a beard. I will talk as neutral as possible and be as forgettable as I, I can possibly want to be. Uh, and then on the flip side, yeah, yeah. if I'm trying to get somebody's attention, that's when I'm going to stand up. But I'm going to stand out to that person and only that person. Oh, wow, that's really good. Um, here's a question that I know that you've never been asked on a podcast before. <laughs> it, it's it. relating to business. So okay. a lot of my listeners are first responders that are in business. Mm -hmm. And um, I know your thing is body language. Um, have you played card? Well, first question is, do you play cards with people? And are you really good at reading like when someone is bluffing? Right. So I have done, I have played cards with people. I actually learned the hard way uh, how good poker players are at, at like kind of body language with that kind of thing at reading others. So it was great for me. But since being ranked number 28 in the world body language expert, nobody wants to play anymore with me when it comes to poker. They're just like, no, we're not. And, and I haven't got any better or any worse. But you know, for some I would reason... love to play with you because <laughs> I want to test your skills at, in poker and I want to see if. Like, I, I think the easiest way in poker to do well mm -hmm. is to actually have a good hand and them not believe you for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. That's it's it's much easier to have a good hand and not be bluffing than it is to try and bluff. And the guy think, uh, you know, is he bluffing? Is he not bluffing? So I, I, I'd love to play with you. I'd be curious to see. I'd be curious to test your skills. It'd be kind of cool because I would I would probably go down the strategy route, to be fair, and I would probably get, if I got three poor hands, I would do something to give it a signal to show that I'm bluffing, uh, and, and, and then people would kind of pick up on that tell, go, yeah, every time he's bluffing, he does that. And then when I got a nice big hand, I'd do that tell deliberately, you know, get people going all in and, and, and saying, yeah, we know he's bluffing, we know he's bluffing, and then that, <laughs> that's when I flip him over and say, yeah, no, it wasn't that time. So, <laughs> so here's my question for business. Mm -hmm. um, being an NLP expert, well, okay, first, can you talk about NLP and explain yeah. like what that is? So uh, NLP is, is a form of um, 
Neuro kind of sales, sales on steroids. Yeah, neuro linguistic pro- programming it stands for, and I mean it, it. It can be considered a form of mind control if you want to go down that route, and I, I use it all the time. But if you can imagine, um, here's here's an example of an audible anchor. Um, the everybody has got that one particular song that whenever they hear it, they just feel good. You know, they blast, they turn the volume up on, on the car. They're, they're suddenly doing over the speed limit. And they're like, yeah, it does this is great. It doesn't matter what it is, whether it's Bohemian Rhapsody or whatever, whatever it is for you that does it. Everybody's got that. Song. That's an audible anchor. It means something at some point that you probably don't even remember happened in your life while that song was on and you just felt so good and it stayed with you. And there's visual anchors, there's verbal anchors, there's audible anchors, there's even anchors that you can smell. You know, you've probably done it yourself. You've gone past a bakery or a petrol station or anything at all. You've gone, oh, and it's just taking you back to your childhood. You know, something that's just taking you back so many years. And that, that's a, what they call an olfactory anchor. Now, you can set these anchors either in yourself or in other people. And the way to do it is... Um, so I'll give you an example. If I wanted, if I wanted to use my wife as an example, when we got together, every time we were having really great time and everything was fun, I would touch her on the left elbow and she would relate that connection, that contact of being touched on the left elbow to something positive. And then every time something was really dreadful happening, I'd touch her on the right elbow and she'd relate that to something negative. So therefore, if I wanted to go out uh, on a Friday night with the lads, I'd say, hey, sweetheart, I'm going to go down the bar and I'd touch her on the left elbow and have a few drinks with the lads. Is that okay with you? And she'd get that that kind of positive feeling from that, you know, that, that association and go, yeah, sure, that's fine. Um, you know, and at the same time, if she wanted to go to the mother-in-law's for Thanksgiving, I'd touch her on the right elbow and say, you sure this is a good idea? She's like, yeah, no, my brother's going to be there and they'll all be getting drunk again. And so this is how you can do it and how you can use it in, in a, a tactical way. It's a bit manipulative, but if you wanted to, that's how it can be used. So that's pretty crazy. That's pretty wild. So does <laughs> it make you a better speaker from the stage or a better salesperson or both? Does it like how does it how does it improve you? So it can do. I mean, so if you wanted to set an anchor in yourself, for example, um, you can either either think and visualize a time that you were really on fire and maybe touch your your knuckle on on your hand um either that or every time you're out and you're having a really really great time you know that song's on the radio again touch your knuckle uh in exactly the same spot every time and build that up in every possible way so when whenever you're feeling confident you can touch that knuckle and and it sets that anchor that association um to to confidence so just before you're about to go on a podcast or a stage or a tv show or anything you want to do if you're not quite feeling that vibe just touch that knuckle and it'll bring back that ah hang on i feel good again and that that's kind of how it works and it takes time this is not something you can do three times and go how why isn't it working you know this is something that it does take time to cement this in place but if anybody's familiar with the experiment of Pavlov and his dogs, yes, you're familiar with it, where yes, he used yes. to ring the bell, yeah, yes, and he'd do it every time he fed them, and eventually he could ring the bell, and without having to feed them, the dogs would salivate. It's exactly the same system. It's just used on humans, and that power of association, it just kind of um, it can help convince people to do what you want them to do, like steal secrets. Yeah, no, that's actually a really really good tip. Um, where could someone go to learn? NLP is there like classes online yeah uh there is I mean now I I um I learned directly from Richard Bandler the co-creator of NLP and he still does lessons and seminars and that kind of thing now there are loads of things online where it says hey be a an NLP practitioner for seven dollars you know in 30 minutes don't waste your money don't waste your time you know if you're gonna learn these things go to the best go to the man that created it uh and say hey teach me it's not for for what you get out of it, it's not a lot of cash. It's a good investment, you know, to in, yeah. if you're investing in yourself. Is elicitation related to NLP? Like what is what is that? No, so elicitation, this is a this is a beautiful little thing that, that um spies use in the world of human intelligence gathering. And this is where we might be talking to somebody who's unintentionally going to give us information without them knowing about it. Uh, and we'll use certain techniques to extract information out of them. And and it's all done in a very unassuming way. Um, so you'll be having a standard conversation. You've kind of in your mind planned it out that it's going to be, uh, say, I don't know, 30 minutes long. 
And what you will do 14 minutes in, this is where you will kind of set up the question that you want the answer to. Uh, that will take you kind of two minutes to get answered. And then 14 minutes out, you'll talk about something else. So you, you, you're, uh, and this is all down to something called the primacy and the recency effect. People tend to remember the beginning and the end of a conversation and not so much in the middle. So you, you're kind of getting that, that little bit of information that you need out of them without them even remembering they ever give it to you. Uh, 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 that's a really cool spy trick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this is all done through... So elicitation is a form of getting information without asking questions. So um, I could say to you uh, something, for example, like, hey, that flag you've got in the background there, that's a, a policeman, a fireman, a nurse, and a um, civil servant, right? Yes. And you'll go, uh, well, yeah, but that guy in the bottom left, he's actually, he's a, he's a something else. And, and what it is, this is the, a technique where it's the need to correct. Ah. So, yeah. So I, I will, I will kind of deliberately say something wrong and, you know, and, and people will then try to, to correct me. There's, there's, a, there's several different techniques that you can use and statements that you can make. And these statements are what they call provocative statements, and they're designed to provoke a response out of the person. And it might be the need to correct. It might be, um, it, it could be any number of, of different reasons why somebody responds. But but because of the fact that it's a statement and not a question, it doesn't arouse suspicion. So this is something that detectives could use when interviewing mm -hmm. suspects. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, th there is. Uh, I mean, I, I don't so much teach it anymore in, in courses and whatever else. I, I can recommend places that do, uh, one in particular. But, you know, there are great ways to learn elicitation. And, and once you've mastered the art of it, it's fantastic because you'll find yourself using it all the time. At first, it feels really weird because you, you default to want to go to a question. And for all you guys out there or other podcast users and podcasters and whatever else, it's a fantastic way uh, of of getting into like for example at the beginning you said you were in the army right and I said no I'm not I, I was I was I joined the reserves and then this happened and that happened so it, it's you you can make these what they call a false statement and mm. then it, it gets somebody to to kind of continue but giving you information yeah 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 I um I, I'm a natural when it comes to like building rapport with people mm -hmm. and I don't say that to brag, <laughs> but, um, I actually, I connect with people pretty easily. So like, I always say I'm, I'm pretty good in, in the box. We'll, we'll call it the box, you know, <laughs> in, interviewing people. Um, because I do, I do naturally elicit information. Like people will tell me, especially like at the gym, uh, I'll just have a short conversation with people and they'll tell me so much about their life without me even like barely even trying. And I always laugh when I'm talking with someone and they barely ask me about me and I, <laughs> they just want to talk, talk, talk. Cause you know, everyone's favorite subject is themselves. Exactly. So, uh, and this is something we definitely kind of utilize and, and you, you know, we leverage the fact that people love to talk about themselves, their lives, what's going on. Um, uh, and if you've done it right, your, your conversation from the beginning has gone from a 50 50 exchange to a 90 10 exchange you know uh, you're, you're listening 90 percent of the time and talking 10 percent of the time you know and, and now listening is that a skill that you had to train like you're training your listening ear yeah and i'm still crap at it <laughs> <laughs> so um active listening wise is something that because we live in a world now where so many people don't listen to hear that or listen to understand they listen to respond and everybody waiting to say their bit. And and it is very, very difficult. Unfortunately for me, I'm one of these people, I'm constantly watching what's going on around me. I'm listening to what you're saying. Um, I, you know, I've, got, I've got several things going on uh, at once, uh, and I'm very easily distracted. You know, If I hear something that, that doesn't sound right in the background, I'm like, oh, that's got my attention. So I have to, I have to occasionally like force myself to say, hey, pay attention, dude. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you go down to a restaurant with your missus, mm -hmm. are you able to put your back to the door and and like no. you can't? <laughs> 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 so it's so funny because everyone's like, oh, it's ingrained in the culture. And I've forced myself to 
kind of let my guard down and kind of rejoin the civilian world. Uh, my my girl, she knows which chair I want I want to sit in. She already knows. So sometimes I'll say, uh, depending on the environment, of course. Yeah. You know, but I'll say, no, I'll take you know I'll I'll switch with you and I'll, I'll reverse. Um, and, but sometimes I'll have a reflection, you know, where I could, I could see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, my wife, exactly the same. Uh, and of course it's got to the point now where even my daughter, she's just you know, not long turned 11 and we'll go out and she's picking the tables in the restaurants. Cause she'll say like, daddy, I want to sit in that one. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> she's got it. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, so I, I had to train myself to not overstep, uh, when, when on a podcast, and when I was a beginning podcast, because I had my list of questions mm-hmm. and like you, you were saying, I had to get away from, okay, I want to ask the next question because sometimes your response leads to a really, really great creative question. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I'm like, oh, wait, I forgot. This is what I really want to talk about, you know, and I, uh, I've gotten away from having structured questions and just having a more 50 50 conversation Mm. and just seeing where it leads it it makes for a much better conversation and uh and people that listen have told me uh it just sounds like two friends talking i'm like oh good that's exactly (laughs) what it should sound like because i don't want it to sound like i'm interviewing you i want it to be two old friends having a conversation about their career Mm -hmm. and and the the tricks and trade you know the craft the trade craft uh, as, as you call it. Um, Is it, are are you doing anything illegal by like revealing these secrets? Not, not the trade craft side of things. No. So uh, unless I speak specifically about like a person or information that was, that was, gained or, or something along those lines the the actual the information itself or or the or the, the person involved is, is what is more so the secret than than anything else so um the majority of things like training wise and that type of thing again no problem there are there are things that that are say locations or training facilities and that kind of thing or or, or that, that it's not necessarily that it's secret but it's just it wouldn't be the done thing to start telling people where they are. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. black sites, they're a real thing. Yep. They are. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so when you watch a movie and you're like, Oh, he went to a black site. I knew I, I I'm like, I knew that, you know, you just know that that's a real thing. Um, the most interesting black sites in the world are mobile. Wow. Airplanes being one of them. Yeah. Yeah, that makes that makes total sense. Are there planes that don't have to land? They just get refueled. Um, the, the, yeah, there are some mid-air planes, but they, they do everything has to kind of what goes up must come down kind of thing, yeah it? yeah after a while. But uh, the the whole uh, the, the, these things don't land very often, but they they do. You know, obviously it's it's the same as I mean we've got submarines, we've got nuclear submarines that can stay under the water indefinitely. But the crew that are on there, they, they you know, they, they couldn't stay on there indefinitely. You know, right. it's, it's 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 the human element that's the problem. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, technology going the way it's going, I see robots controlling these things with with less less humans needed for the crew. Um, I know you can't speak to some of the innovations and in technology that they have, but you can agree with me that. We we will have more robots controlling more of our machinery, uh, whether it's subs or planes. Um, you know, planes now fly themselves. Yeah, <laughs> but, um, technology as we know it is just going, especially over the next few years, is going to completely change in in so many ways and the 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 introduction of ai into the public domain and 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 other things there are going to be that many autonomous systems and and the kind of the next kind of battles as it were will literally be cyber battles it will be people like saying we've got your sub you know you, we've got your, your your this and we know that there's nuclear missiles on board or whatever the case may be and and, and you're going to pay us to get it back or you you know and and this is this is how it's going to be it's going to be done more of a cyber war than a than a, a frontline war the majority of the time in in the 
you know, in the, in the up and coming future, as it were. Uh, I would prefer that versus a uh, physical war. What is um, what's humid? I, I might be pronouncing it incorrectly. Yeah, no, human, you know, human humming. Which is, so it's human intelligence, um, and this is this is something where you know we were talking about before having like what what the police would sometimes call a confidential informant. Or, yes. So th this is how we we kind of gather intelligence. Um, so if we want somebody who is say a high ranking officer in the Kremlin or a, or a, a top of a terrorist organization or well whatever the case may be whether it's political whatever, um, we will pick a particular person. Um, we will infiltrate that person's life somehow, and it'll the, the methods and techniques will change depending on who and where they are. Um, and then the the objective is to recruit that person to get them to give you information and um, and this is where yeah go, go, i have go. a question for you yeah is sex the most powerful driver because <laughs> you you made me think about uh chinese spies and there was a, a u.s uh i don't know if it was a congressman or a senator or whatever they were some somewhere high in government mm -hmm. and they had a uh identified chinese spy as a girlfriend it's used a lot and i mean like because uh, the russians did it a lot during the cold war um i think they were called swallows or something like that uh, swallows? <laughs> yeah, swallows or sparrows or something along those lines sparrows um, yeah. sparrows um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and then um you got the the, you know, the the germans actually used a male counterpart called romeos uh and this was down to the fact that homosexuality at the time was so taboo in russia that you know, it was probably one of you know. I mean, the, the, it was it was a death sentence if if you were you know high ranking officer and and you know it was discovered. So um, so there was, there was that side of it, and and yeah, I mean, all, all intelligence agencies have used it, um, but it's not necessarily the default. Okay, but it is an extremely powerful way to infiltrate someone's pillow talk. Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah, with that. Right? Down. So the, what what we tend to look at quite simply is money access. Uh, well, sorry, no motivation, access, uh, and security. Um, so your motivation could be anything. It could be sex. You know, some people are highly sexed and are easily led astray by uh, you know an attractive person. And then you've got the other side of it. Some people are money hungry. Some people it could be ideology. Um, there's, there's but whatever. We, you know, when, we, when we're establishing a, a POL or pattern of life for the target and we're looking at what they do, we will also uh, take into account what motivates them, what gets them mm. up out of bed in the morning. And that's what we will dangle as as our kind of like, you know, this is what you can get out of it. So I'll tell you two, two of my motivations. I'm highly motivated by money. And I'm also highly motivated by not going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I don't want to do anything that's illegal. So if someone approached me with uh, something that would compromise mm -hmm. my freedom, mm -hmm. it's an absolute, we're not, we're not going mm -hmm. anywhere near that. Yeah. But if someone approached me with a good opportunity that seemed somewhat legitimate, mm -hmm. that could be, I just know that's, that's a weakness for me because I, I, uh, I got it inherited from my mom where she would get sucked into the infomercials, the TV infomercials, and she would buy so much stuff from those infomercials. And I know that I'm an easy sale, especially when it comes to increasing my bank account, increasing mm -hmm. my money. Got you. And we would we would exploit that in the sense of we would go down the route of, of giving you a good chunk of cash. And saying, I just need you to do, uh, you know, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be like a, a, a conversation like what we're having now. Right. I, said, I just need you to do me a little favor. And you go, what? And you go, I need you to tell me um, the tire size on the Crown Victorias that you're using down at your station. That's uh, all I need. It's the tire size, right? Nothing else. Yeah. And you go away and you come back and you say, yeah, they're, you know, 195 R18s or whatever. And I go, okay, brilliant. Thank you. There, there's five grand. And you go, wow, <laughs> that was easy money. For a tire size, that yeah, you, know, you could walk up to any patrol car and and you know to see that. That would raise a red flag for me. <laughs> yeah, and, and of course it might it might not be that huge amount right, of, right, of right, money, right. and it might yeah, but but it it starts off with very small asks, very small yes. favors, and and like kind of 
eventually we, we'd kind of build up and build up and build up and you go, oh, brilliant, you've got the tyre size, that's fantastic. Hey, what, what size engines are in them? Yeah, and uh, then it'd be like, and, and how many, how much fuel do they carry? And you know, do you have a shotgun in the boot? Is that true? Yeah, and and then before you know it, this is kind of you know, and and I've got the specs on the car, and you go, and where do you park them? You know, is there, is the parking I have to tell you, back? I have to tell you a, a funny story of a guy that I used to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll say 15, 15 to twenty years ago, he had a childhood friend that he grew up with in the city who sold large amounts of uh, soft drugs. Mm. So I don't want to say what type of drug it was, but we'll just <laughs> say, we'll just say soft drugs. He sold soft okay. drugs, large quantities. And my particular agency was on to the bad guy. Mm. During one of his conversations with the guy I used to work with, the guy, the, the bad guy, or we'll say the actor asked the cop, what type of undercovers uh, no. are <laughs> and and they were childhood friends mm -hmm. and he told him what kind of cars they use yeah. and he like I think he really didn't think anything of it mm -hmm. like why his friend was asking that question I don't know I don't know his his state of mind when he got asked the question mm -hmm. but I remember hearing the story and he got in big trouble for that yeah. to where he almost got fired and um you know, he got put on, um, he got suspended and put on like, uh, you know, like special, special assignment where it's not so special. It's not so much fun, <laughs> but you know what I mean? But as soon as you started asking about the tire size and then more things about the car, it made me think about that story. And uh, do you have any stories uh, that you can share or that you stare, that you share from the stage about um intelligence or like elicitation are, are there any stories that you can, can share I, I i can share one that, that that kind of might burst a bubble for one or two people because when i first got into the whole uh intelligence side of it because you got you got different types of intelligence different types of assignments and, and you know like human being one of them and i i remember like so many other people you see movies and, you know, and, and you've got this kind of, you know, image in your mind of, you know, oh, they'll have a great big cavernous kind of ops room where they'll give you a, uh, you know, a slideshow of this is the man we're after and this is the island he's living on and he gets there by helicopter and, you know, he's got this happening. And all Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey yeah, Epstein. You know, <laughs> yeah. and, um, and they say, you know, we, we want you to to kind of, you know, parachute in there and, and you know, kind of, you know, find out what he's doing with all this plutonium. Uh, and of course, you know, th this is what I kind of expected, you know, it to be like. And and I remember, like, the very first assignment I was ever given was one sentence. And I sat down, and there was three other people in the room, and they said, find out how the Russians are getting railgun intelligence out of Korea. Okay. And I sat there, I was waiting for the PowerPoints and the other bit, and, and, you know, and the only thing I got was, why are you still here? Wow. <laughs> so, uh, oh is that it then you know no, no, no gadgets no, no get out of here get your job done um so yeah that was a, that was a bit of a bump and it was like kind of okay didn't quite expect it to be just like that and and that was it i was left on my own go and find out and get the information which i did um and quite happily did it um without even leaving the uk in fact i did most of it from my living room um it's oh, really cool me a couple of days so so yeah uh it, it, so there's a lot of things in in the intelligence world that you know you, you you're given the impression that it's all rubber masks and biking off mountains and, and that kind of thing but it, 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 a lot of it's actually quite the opposite i um tried to find you on linkedin mm -hmm. uh so i could connect with you but i don't think you're on there or maybe we just don't have any uh um close connections ah, okay yeah i am on there uh okay. yeah I'll, I'll send you a link over um to your email yeah all right that sounds good and if um are, are you promoting anything i i know you wrote a couple books yeah so i, I got my my best-selling book was uh called how to tell if someone is lying so here's here's a business strategy for everybody um this the, the book was done very very deliberately in a very deliberate way i've got friends from 
uh, MI6 who've written a bit, friends from Special Forces who've written a bit, friends from the American Army and American agencies that have written a little bit, and I've put them all in there. And what happened is I knew it was going to be a bestseller before I started for two reasons. One, I've got all of their audiences yes, <laughs> because they've all yes. contributed to my book. And the second one, and this is the most important one for you, for you guys, is the title, How to Tell If Someone Is Lying, wasn't accidentally it's a dreadful title i know but it was based on a google search yes and the fact is you know something like a hundred thousand people a month type in how to tell if someone is lying not yeah you know, and it's a great the, title no yeah. it's a great title so and, and of course it brings my book straight to the top and that was uh that was guaranteed to kind of uh you know grab the attention of of kind of anybody that wanted the information so that that was a bestseller uh, and still does very well now i've got a another dreadful book that i'm really embarrassed by which is about 30 or 40 pages long called cold read like a spy and it sells every day and everybody loves it what's uh, it called what's it called so, code or coal Cold read like a spy. C O L D. Cold read like a spy. Cold read like a right. spy. And if ever you've seen these um, so-called fortune tellers or people like that, or anybody who walks up and say, "I can tell by looking at you that you're a man. You were born in this month. You did. You know. You you went to this school. You. This is your career. This. Year. And and people are like, "Wow, how does he do that?" The answers are all in that book. Okay. All right. Yeah. Don't be ashamed, man. That's a, that's a actually. Oh, it, sound- it, it's dreadfully. I mean, it really is. It's full of typos. It was thrown together. It was used Amazon cover creator. It was a stock images. Every. I mean, it really. It was. It was actually thrown together as as a part of a split test to see what works and what doesn't. And unfortunately, it does that well that I, that I can't take it down because it's it's a great little book. Uh, you can do. Uh, you could do a revised or part two if you really wanted to spruce it up a little bit. But uh, that is a really valuable lesson for my audience Mm -hmm. because people are waiting to make their perfect book. They're waiting Ah, to make their their ideal scenario where like they sit down and they've written this masterpiece. And really what you did was you threw together a very quick idea Mm -hmm. and you started making money from it. Yeah. Um, Um, Do you also speak on stages for about these topics? Uh, I do. I, I I I give training. Um, I'm I'm actually working on for for the like the middle of next year, putting a uh, online course together. Um, and this I, I'm 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 going down the road of several different ideas at the minute. Of one for elicitation, uh, one for body language and deception detection, one for kind of sales and and, and all the different areas. And I'm just trying to figure out at the minute what the most demand is there for and what people are going to be able to utilize and get the best out of. My one piece of advice for you is to sell it first and then create it. Don't mm-hmm. create it first. Sell, just sell yeah. it. See, <laughs> see what, like you said, see where the demand is. See what That's people uh, want to buy, and then start recording videos with people live. Mm-hmm. And uh, then you sell. Then yeah, you sell well, the product. Get That's some good exactly editing. Good. Yeah. 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 I mean, with the, with the book, I mean, it was part that split testing was part of the you know the process of learning what sells and what doesn't. You know, I mean, my my debut fiction novel, The Unforgiven Spy. That is that is like my my kind of uh, the the one that I got my money behind, uh, and I've written another one since then called Questionable Tactics, um, which I I put so much great content in it, and yet it doesn't get anywhere near as much attention as the Cold Read Like a Spy book. So uh, yeah. that's hilarious. That's really yeah. funny, Gavin. I appreciate you so so much. Thank you for coming on to the show. It was a lot of fun. I just have five uh, fast questions before I yeah. got to run. Um, <laughs> What's your definition of a hero? Because that's what the show is about. It's about teaching what society calls heroes. Somebody who goes above and beyond selflessly to help others. And when stress is at its highest and you're starting to feel like you're reaching your breaking point, how do you save yourself? Uh, it used to be alcohol, but <laughs> I've actually stopped drinking now for Good. two years. Um, so I, I use something called the EC, I, ICBM, which most military guys will think is intercontinental ballistic missile. Uh, uh-huh. It's actually instant calm breath method. Okay. Uh, All right, cool. Yeah, a lot of people have told me about that instant uh, calm breath method. Uh, that's actually the best i in my opinion the best way to save yourself from any situ any stressful situation um how about coaching down the line would you do some uh coaching for people yeah. um as another stream of income because i know you have like several right now 
<laughs> yeah, I have done a little bit of coaching and mentoring for for certain people. Um, uh, uh, more so, uh, it's usually one to one for a certain amount of time. Um, they'll come to me and say, "Can you teach me this?" And I'll say, "Yeah or no." Basically. Yeah, no, it's an excellent, no, uh, excellent additional source of income. Uh, what's your greatest power? What's your best ability today? At the minute, um, I would say doing my best to be the best dad I can to my daughter. <laughs> That's a great answer. But you did mention at the top of the show that you're number 28 in the world mm -hmm. of body language experts. So yeah. I thought you I thought you were going to say that, but uh, you went in a completely <laughs> different direction. That's, that's that's really cool. And just for fun, if you had a comic book superpower mm -hmm. and you needed to save your daughter with it, what would your power be and why? Oh, it would be to pass on everything I've ever learned in my life telepathically to my my daughter so that she can literally have all the experience I've got and learn from it without it affecting her the way it's affected me. Ah, uh, that's a beautiful answer. Thank you so much, brother. Um... <laughs> all right, all right, family. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Everyone I interview, I've chosen for you guys because of their story. And I hope that you get some value every single time. If you did get value or just, just simply enjoyed the episode, please share the episode with someone that you know. If you know of a guest, a frontline hero that has an amazing story, something uplifting or a positive message, hit me up in the contact form of www.davidleith.com or DM me at Instagram at David Leith, the number one. Subscribe to the show because I have some really phenomenal guests coming up in the next few weeks that you definitely don't want to miss. All right, one.